Hey folks, I got a chance to work with Maximilian and the Twitch Rivals team on their KI Libs event earlier this week and put together a few video packages from Fight On, my documentary on KI. There's some new footage in here too, including a look at our next big doc on the music and audio of KI. Make sure you're subbed to the channel to know when that one goes live. Enjoy the videos! With the Xbox One on the horizon, Microsoft would bring back Killer Instinct to bolster their launch lineup. Making a fighting game is an endeavor, so now they needed to find the right team to bring the game to life. So what happened is, at the time, I was working as the creative director for XBLA, which if you remember for the Xbox 360 was all, we had this incredible digital library of games, right? But they were the games that only shipped digitally. Basically, they didn't go to a box. And I'd always loved fighting games. And so I'm sitting here in XBLA and I, I'm watching the whole portfolio come in and all these games that we're doing in all these different genres, but no fighting games. And I was like, shouldn't we have a fighting game in this portfolio? Like, we've got all these other genres covered, we have nothing for fighting. But this was one of those occasions that I was like, well, the game's probably not gonna come to us, so what if we did it? And so I mentioned this to Ted, and Ted went, you need to talk to Ken Lobb. So we're about a year before the launch of Xbox One, and Adam Isgreen comes to me, hey, we should do Killer Instinct. Well, yeah, but there's problems. You don't have no developer, you know, none of the team is around. And then an RFP came in and Patrick came to me. Patrick was our studio head at the time and he goes, hey, Mike, Microsoft is looking for developers to work on Killer Instinct. And I was like, then we got to go do this. <laughs> there's no question in my mind. We have to put something together. And at that time, we set up a gray box and basically replicated all of KI2. Our approach towards developing the prototype actually gave us really cool insights into actually how to approach the actual final game as well. We want to recreate Killer Instinct as accurately as possible, or at least the systems involved accurately as possible, in a short amount of time as possible. Because you know, when you're a developer that's competing against other developers, you've got to do stuff you know quickly and timely. You don't have a certain amount of time. So that was one of the things we were trying to prove: was like we can get this done at a high quality in a short amount of time. Fast forward a little bit, we got responses from a couple, man, we'd love to do this, but we're too busy. Iron Galaxy was one of those. They're like, if you wait six months, we would love to do this, please, please, please. And we're like, we got a launch coming. We think we might be able to hit a launch game. So I'm sorry, Iron Galaxy, but you're off the list. One team came back with a prototype. And even better, they came back with this letter, this sort of, you know, the dream of making a killer instinct. And that was Double Helix. And so I, I went from, why would we want them, their sixth, to playing this white box prototype and going, you know, they kind of get it. The thing that originally, I think, clinched it for Double Helix was the passion that they had. Every time we met them, you could sense it, it's, it's a projection of love and of delight when you start talking about KI. And you could tell that this was more than just a job to them. This was something they really were hungry to do. And I think the studio at the time, Double Helix, was hungry to prove itself too, right? That like, hey, we can step up above. I'm not trying to disservice them by saying like B-tier games, but they were making a lot of games that would have you know, probably ended up on XBLA with some that go in the boxes, a lot of licensed games. But it's like, this is our shot at doing something great. And wow, did they take it. Like, they just took it and ran with it. Coming to your home in 2013, only on Xbox One! Jago! Ah! Ah! Seeing KI just pop up on that big gigantic screen, I just like lost my mind, dude. I was just like, oh my god, KI is back. Killer Instinct. We listened, and Killer Instinct is back, only on Xbox One. Slain admired and wanted to work with for a long time. I'm fucking crying. Yo, check this out. Combat and Killer Instinct takes the mind games of fighting games and pushes them to the next level. What goes into a Killer Instinct combo and separates it from other fighting games? The way I always explain KI to people who are brand new is that I say, the combos in KI are like sandwiches, right? Every sandwich has two pieces of bread. If it doesn't have two pieces of bread, well, first of all, you either got ripped off or it's like a really bad sandwich. You need two quality pieces of bread. 
And what kind of bread is up to you as well, right? There's lots of different ways that characters can open combos, which is the first piece of bread, and end combos, which is the bottom piece of bread. So you can have, you know, a high damaging opener, something like a nice sour dough. You can have something that's a little weak, you know, a little thin white bread that's barely hanging in there. You put a tomato in there, this thing melts, right? It's got like the moisture from it, it'll destroy this bread. So you got the bread, that's the opener and the ender. Then in the middle, you're gonna stack it with ingredients. And the way I always think about it is like, the meat of it is the normals you put in there. And then after that, you have the linkers. These are special moves. That's like your veggies, right? So your lettuce, your tomato, you got anything in there, right? So when it goes back and forth, you don't wanna just layer it, all meat, all veggies. That's gross, nobody does that. So you have to have like veggies, meat, veggies, meat, veggies, meat, and then close it. I do a normal of some kind, and then a special move of some kind, and a normal of some kind, special move of some kind. You got your meat, your veggies, your meat, your veggies, all the way down. And if you wanna make the sandwich really small, really compact, easy to take a bite out of, that's great, but it doesn't fill you up that much, right? If you make it bigger, a big, fat, heavy sandwich like this, it has more potential to fill you out, but it might spill everywhere. Maybe some other guy's gonna knock your sandwich out of your hands. So you gotta be very careful about the length of your sandwich and the kind of things you put in there. The evolution of that as, as everybody worked their way through it was really cool because it just made it way more open and you could basically express yourself a lot better on how you did combos. In KI it's really interesting because there's a constant interaction between two people. So it's like, I get a combo, so I have to think what is my combo gonna be? I have to worry about like how hard I'm making it to break, what break points I'm giving you, should I reset, should I spend meter, did I react to your lockout? There's all these things I have to think about. For the defensive player, it's every single part of the combo is like, you're recognizing it in your mind, and as it reaches your mind what it is, it needs to be sent to your hands, do I break this part of the combo or not? So it's like constant, like data is going from like game, it's like, all right, that's a heavy linker, hits your brain, do I break the heavy linker, does it need to go down to my hands to break it? No. Next part of the combo, like this, do I need to, no. Next part, man, he still has, I'll hit the, damn it. No matter what's going on in the match, no matter what has happened to you, no matter what mistakes you just made, you can always make a worse one or a better one within just a couple seconds. That's why I think KI is an extremely emotional game. You can't make a decision and then stew on it for a bit. You're like, oh man, I made a mistake. I'm gonna die here. Okay, there's that combo. Okay, here's the little reset. There's none of that. It's you got hit and you have to like viscerally make another decision for like another 30% of your life immediately. And if you don't make that decision, you have to make another one. It stacks your mistakes on top of each other very quickly. And in the end, when you win or lose, when you win, you feel like relieved. That was exciting. And I'm so glad I made like all these correct decisions that it feels great. And when you lose, you're like, oh, I like, this is the worst. Like, I can't believe, you know, you're excited to get back into it. Because Rift was an instinct, the extra damage and the throw. TJ's coming back. <laughs> that face. Life is so hard, dude. <laughs>
We had the discussion. Not many people at Iron Galaxy even knew that was happening. I was brought into that because uh, they wanted me to be lead combat designer. So I was like really studying the game at that point instead of playing it, you know, casual competitive like I play everything. I was like really digging in in a way I hadn't since like Tatsunoko versus Capcom. We knew that, well, you're not building this from scratch and there's this relatively bespoke, not perfect piece of middleware that Killer Instinct is built upon. We want that. It ha it's perfect, but you're gonna have to learn how to use it. So it was gonna take some time. We were already using James, but that's where he became significantly more involved to help go and you know, teach is the wrong word. And Iron Galaxy is very smart, but sort of just show them tools of the trade. Even better, this goes to the infinite respect for Double Helix. They took a month to overlap train Iron Galaxy and everything they'd need to know to build the game. It gave us a chance, an impossible chance. You can tell that like they got the project and Microsoft's like, congratulations, you guys are now working on KI. And they're like, great. And they're like, how long until we need a character? Tomorrow. And they're like, oh God. So they just like had to scrap together a bunch of stuff. How well they did with it is honestly astounding to me. Like it's crazy how the first two characters were so cool. Their designs were so interesting, TJ and Maya. And then after that, all the characters that came out, they started looking better. They started animating better. They started having these crazy game plans. The Ripter came out after that and we're like, what the heck is this character? There's a dinosaur? I was like, all right, well, even though in the beginning, I think everybody's a little nervous. To me, when I saw the character designs and everything, I was like, perfect. They realized that this is a game with like a ninja guy fighting like a robot guy, fighting a dinosaur, fighting, fighting a guy who's literally fire, fighting a giant golem. Like this game is absurd. Killer Instinct was built with a focus on online play, and in order to ensure that matches with friends miles away felt the same as they did in person, the developers relied on the mystical technology that is... Rollback Netcode. We had very strict pillars of the game of like what was the most important, and if things didn't fit within those pillars, they got, you know, cut. So like for us, it was like rebooting what KI was bringing back those feelings, those emotions, that nostalgia, but updating it. It was having a tournament viable combat. Every input needed to be tight and responsive. And then also it needed to play well online. Every modern game has to play well online. If you can't do that, you're dead on arrival. Well, we were like, okay, so we're gonna make the fighter and we wanted to make the best KI we could. And the GGPO style networking was the best that we could get. Early on, we had all of our animators and designers and everything set up all of their animations such that they know that this rollback can happen so that we can make conscious decisions of what can happen when a rollback happens at a specific point. A lot of that is sort of a team effort that we got it all such that it handles everything correctly. Early on we, is when we decided we need to use this netcode. And how rollback netcode works is that we never wait for the next frame. We still have our delay of, let's say, two or three frames. So let's say we're at 90 ping and roll back netcode. Three frames later, my inputs are gonna play because we have that delay of three. And I've got your inputs now, it's gonna play. It's just like delay-based netcode. It's literally identical. Rollback is delay-based netcode, but it's got more features. So what happens when I don't get your input or the delay changes? That's what rollback does differently. Instead of stopping and waiting for your inputs, what rollback does is it says, I have my local inputs, I'm going to the next frame. I don't care. I'm gonna predict what my opponent was doing. And all we do for that prediction is we just replay whatever was happening on the last frame. If they're holding forward, it's a pretty safe assumption that they're probably gonna to continue to hold forward. Maybe they stopped, maybe they didn't, but we're gonna pretend they did. But in most cases, I would say 80% of the time in a fighting game, you're in a committed action. But in the odd cases where somebody was walking forward, we thought they would continue to walk forward, but they actually jumped or they actually hit a button. We're gonna get their inputs a few frames later because they dropped them or because the, the ping went up. And then the game is going to be able to look at the game state, rewind a few frames to where we didn't have the inputs and say, did this match? Did what we get match exactly what we guessed? And if it didn't, it re-simulates the game state in one frame back up to the current frame, totally invisible to the player, and then just renders the next frame normally. Your end is always three frames. Your combos always work the same. Your reaction time is always the same. You can actually learn the offline version of the game online because of rollback netcode. 
and it's an old technology and it's not a particularly complicated technology. It's just a matter of developers saying, yes, this is valuable to us and we want to do this. And getting the message out there to say, look what this did for Killer Instinct. It has a thriving scene you know, after development has even stopped. Uh, people are finding matches lightning fast in this game. They can play people all across the world. Like, this is, this is magic. You have to do this. Music and audio is as important to the legacy of Killer Instinct as its characters and combos, and the teams involved with its return in 2013 knew they had to go above and beyond to stay true to that legacy. I've always thought that audio and, and music is one of those things that is one of the most impactful things you can do in a movie, in a television show, in a video game, but yet so many people don't index on it enough to make it a part of the experience it should be. Double Helix, just they embraced that, and they saw what was so important about it in the original game. The original KI had a very specific look and feel that was so different, like you mentioned, and we wanted to stay true to that as well, so we got to work with Mick Gordon. He just, he got it. I absolutely adored my time on Killer Instinct. I had I have so many great memories of season one and season two. I remember this idea of like, you remember the original Killer Instinct uh, where there was the Ultratech? They were the company that ran the tournament, right? And I, I remember thinking this idea of like Ultratech's gonna be like synthetic and sort of disjointed and have the, lots of cool sounds, right? I'd imagine that. So I took that same da da dun 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 dun, -dun and just went sort of right, really cyber with it. Well, interestingly enough, we were actually working on three of those tracks at the same time, kind of. It was it was Maya, background vocals for TJ Combo, and uh, The Way You Move, which was a soundtrack exclusive. But Maya was definitely, you know, the, the project at the forefront of all of our minds. I think it had the tightest deadline, needed to be done first, needed to com be completed first. And you were the featured vocalist. And I was the one. featured vocalist. Yeah. And I remember how Mick pitched it to me. He said, I want it to be like an alley choir. Like, I just want your voice everywhere in the song. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot of pressure, but also really exciting. I had just come off of finished working on Halo 2 Anniversary, so I understood the Halo DNA incredibly well. And as soon as they said, well, we're bringing a Halo character, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, I know I just finished doing that music, recreating it. I know all of those themes, but then it was a little intimidating because it's like, okay, how are we going to killer instinctize this? I'll lead into Clay, but man, when he... <laughs> He went as far as singing, recording his voice and lowering the pitch and some doing some crazy stuff in there. But take it away, Clay. Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting thing. And, and that was the beautiful thing, too, was having Tom's experience. We just deferred to Tom and his like his knowledge of the project. And it's like, can I get away with this? Should I do this? Um, so cutting vocals, making up basically words like a chant of some sort. And, you know, I think we were both keeping our fingers crossed that when the game is released, we weren't going to be crucified for killing, you know, the Halo franchise versus actually adding to it. And I think we got a, we got a really great response. When you play KI, if you turn off all the sound effects, all the announcers, which you can do in the game, you're gonna see how the music changes on a note-by-note -note basis with combos, with combo breaking, with every gameplay mechanic the game actually sets up. There's a musical beat. The music will actually turn back when a combo breaker happens. 
And then as soon as the payout happens, when you cash out the damage of a combo, it kicks in. <laughs> Leading up to this idea of we're gonna audio script the sound effects of an ultra combo to sound like that character's riff, it's just brilliant. To be like dun dun, dun dun dun, dun dun, and then you get the juggle, dun 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 dun, like at the end, and I was like, what was that? That's the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Community is at the core of Killer Instinct. Their passion has kept the series alive since its inception in 1994, and there seems to be no sign of them slowing down anytime soon. The people in the community, though, you know, they're diehard. They're fans of the game itself. They're not, uh, you know, they're not fake about it. They they love the game, and they're still playing. And it's it's a beautiful thing because it shows you how dedicated they are to the game and how badly they want another game too. It's like almost a cult in a way because it's just like. Uh, <laughs> they're that die-hard about it and that passionate about it that it's like, you know, Killer Instinct before the FGC. There's people that play Killer Instinct that don't play any other fighting games. What definitely helped big time in KI's growth was when Brandon announced the KI Tour and that we would, you know, have something to work towards. It ended up having more people come out to majors. Being a player, a part of it, and somebody who also threw parties occasionally was like full circle for me. The idea of the KI Cup came from obviously Capcom Cup. I felt like Capcom was doing a really great job of representing their game and it inspired me to like, well, you know, it starts with the community. You gotta be the change that you wanna see. I was like, hey Dave, let's put together this world tour. And he was like, you know what, let's, let's try it. You know, we didn't have a huge budget, but we could get a venue, maybe put 10 to $20,000 up for a pop bonus, and then I'll just create a point system. I've been really good friends with Brandon and Brandon, he had like this idea where just like, yeah, you know, the World Cup's gonna be, I just want everyone to have fun and play KI. Literally, that was the basis of it. He just wanted everyone to play the game and be cool with it. The fact that KI World Cup blew up that big, especially the second year around, it was insane. Like, he, he didn't really know how to express how happy it was, and me neither, to be honest. It was cool seeing all these people show up just for the love of the game. And it's just, cause you gotta think about it. Like you're going to the World Cup, yeah, you know, there's only 32 people playing. But they have all these people come in, come through to watch and cheer on and stuff because they genuinely love the game. The game motivated me to keep going at some points in my life. So I can imagine that did the same for other people. And the cool thing about KI as well is that the community was just amazing. Everybody that was a big leader helped in some way. There's just so many pillars of this community that did stuff for it and it just encouraged people to play the game and, and, and to keep playing the game and to share the game because basically everybody just worked together. We were all on the same team and it, it felt that way. Just seeing how many people we've touched, like it's humbling as fuck. Like that was, you know, six plus years ago and people are still into it. Like that's that's awesome. It's it's amazing. It's very emotional for me. It was the first game that I took competitively, traveled the whole country for, met some of the greatest people I've ever met in my entire life because of this game. And it's more than just playing the game for me. You know, I love doing this because of the people too. It's about so much more than just breaking combos and counter breakers. This game like touched a lot of people in some way, uh, very deeply, where they, they truly love it, where it built communities. It, it fulfilled dreams. It did so many things that you want a fighting game to do to build a community. Like the whole thing with esports now is that everyone wants something to become an esport, but Killer Instinct did it perfectly where we're just gonna prove that our game is great, we're just gonna let people play it, and the community is gonna grow as a result. And it's the literal definition of what a fighting game community is. And that carried it to the point of which it had 10 million downloads where people, the word of mouth was good enough to sell KI better than marketing dollars ever could. 